Submarines are a class of ships that are uniquely suited for strategic warfare. Convoy hunting, sneaking up on unsuspecting warships and hitting them with a surprise volley of torpedoes, and creating a general sense of paranoia in any body of water bigger than a lake. However, when submarines were first appearing in combat in the early 20th century, their role wasn't entirely explored or defined by this point, leading to some teething issues on many of the initial designs. One of these was the British K-Class, or as it's better known by now, the Calamity Class. An apt name, considering its design and history. The idea of the K-Class was simple. The Royal Navy wanted to use submarines as part of their fleet in surface warfare by scouting and attacking enemies from a submerged position, and they needed a submarine that was fast enough to keep up with the other ships in the fleet. The required max speed of the class was 24 knots when surfaced to keep pace with other ships in the fleet, which they managed to achieve, along with a submerged speed coming to 8 knots. These speeds were very impressive for a submarine of the time. For comparison, a Type U-151, a German World War I cruiser U-boat, had a surface speed of 12.4 knots and a maximum submerged speed of 5.2 knots, meaning that the K-Class was significantly faster. This comes down to its propulsion system, which is unique for a submarine to say the least. Most submarines at the time were powered by something like a diesel or gasoline engine with batteries to provide power while submerged. However, the K-Class was powered by oil-fired steam turbines. When Admiral Jackie Fisher saw the design of the K-Class submarines, he stated, the most fatal error imaginable would be to put steam engines in a submarine. So, why was this idea so terrible? The first problem is size and weight. Steam turbines are very large compared to diesel engines, and this size and weight is difficult to build around in a submarine. The larger the engine, the larger the submarine, which comes with its own problems. Added costs, less maneuverability, easier detection, you get the idea. The K-Class came to a displacement of roughly 2,000 tons, which made it massive for a World War I submarine. The next issue is air. Boilers need a lot of air intakes and exhaust for combustion, meaning the K-Class needed five air intakes on the stern and two funnels atop the ship. These had to be sealed and the funnels had to be folded down before the ship could submerge, and the K-Class couldn't run its engine underwater or dive quickly in an emergency. The K-Class took roughly five minutes to dive, which was an incredibly long time for a submarine. In a worst case scenario, it could even take up to 30 minutes to dive when going from normal surface operations to submerging. If they tried to dive without properly sealing the intakes and exhausts, it would flood the boilers and engine room, likely taking the entire submarine along with it. Another issue with the slow diving is that it simply limited the lifespan of the K-Class. By World War II, naval aircraft had transformed from a novelty to a major aspect of surface warfare. Having to seal off the air intakes and exhaust before diving meant that the K-Class submarines would be open to air attacks, so if the class had lasted into World War II or if aircraft had been developed faster in World War I, they would have been extremely vulnerable. Overall, Admiral Jackie Fisher was right. Putting steam turbines into a submarine may grant it more power and speed, but it simply was not worth the trade-offs. There are a few other noteworthy aspects of the K-Class too. Its maximum depth was 200 feet, which is pretty normal for a World War I submarine, so not bad. Originally, depth charges were going to be added to the ships. They were eventually removed, but the idea of putting depth charges onto a submarine is pretty ironic. So, how did the 17 ships of the Calamity class perform? For the good news, none of the submarines were ever sunk by enemy actions. For the bad news, six of them were sunk in accidents. As a quick warning for those of you with thalassophobia, the fear of deep water, I'm going to be going over some of these incidents in detail, and it can get very unpleasant. The first incident was on December 1916 when K-3, the first ship of the K-Class submarines, rammed itself into the seabed while diving. To make things worse, the future King of the United Kingdom, George VI, was aboard at the time. K-3 was freed from the seabed and survived, though this was only the beginning of the incidents that would plague the Calamity class. On January 29, 1917, the K-Class submarine K-13 was undergoing its final acceptance trials. At 3.15pm, it began to dive while carrying 80 people aboard the submarine. The boiler room began to flood, so the stern section's watertight door was closed. This sealed the fates of the men aft of the engine room, however there was no alternative if anyone on the submarine was to be saved. Next up, the ballast tanks were blown and the forward keel was dropped, however K-13 would not move towards the surface. Then, a fire began in the main switchboard, consuming some of the limited oxygen aboard the ship. 
By this point, all the crewmen in the stern section of the submarine had died from flooding, and only eight hours of air were left by Professor Percy Hillhouse's estimations. They would need all of this time, as it was six hours before a gunboat and two tugs were sent to the site of K-13's dive. One of the ships arrived with a diving suit, but nobody who was trained to use it. Then when they finally found a diver, the suit turned out to be damaged, nearly killing the diver who tried to use it. Another ship arrived, but had no suit or diver itself, meaning that it was also unable to help. Finally, a civilian diver arrived and went down to K-13, managing to communicate with the crew via Morse code by tapping on the hull. Since time was running out, Lieutenant Commander Herbert formulated a plan to send Goodhart, one of the officers, to the surface by flooding the conning tower and shooting him up with a bubble of compressed air. This plan actually worked too well, shooting Goodhart and the unsuspecting Herbert up to the surface. However, Goodhart had been knocked unconscious, resulting in him drowning before he reached the surface. The first priority was to give K-13 more air, so some divers were sent out with oxygen hoses and attempted to connect them, however they found no way to do so. Through the hull, they got more Morse code signals from the trapped crew, saying give us air. Eventually, a blockage in the hose was fixed and air was supplied to the crew in the submarine, along with food being passed down and voice communications being opened. A wire was attached to the submarine, gradually pulling it towards the surface. While Herbert wanted to bring the crew out through the torpedo tubes, the tubes were stuck under the water due to the instability of the submarine. Finally, an oxyacetylene torch was used to cut holes in the bow, allowing the remaining 46 crewmen aboard to finally be taken out of the submarine. HMS K-13 was taken to a salvage yard and recommissioned as K-22, which will come back up later. Another incident was on November 17, 1917 when K-1 and K-4, both K-class submarines, collided with each other off of the Danish coast. HMS Blonde had to make a turn to avoid three other ships from the 4th Cruiser Squadron, causing K-4 to collide with K-1, crippling it. The crew of K-1 was rescued by some cutters sent by HMS Blanche. Then after K-1 was deemed as unable to be rescued, Blanche scuttled the ship by firing at it. Up next is the Battle of May Island on the 31st of January 1918, where the participants were the Royal Navy and the Royal Navy. The cruiser HMS Fearless collided with the front submarine in their formation, K-17, which sank within eight minutes with all hands. The submarines behind K-17 then turned to avoid HMS Fearless, causing K-6 to collide with K-4, then K-7 also collided with K-4, causing K-4 to sink with all hands. K-22, the rebuilt K-13 I mentioned earlier, also collided with K-14. Both of them survived. Within 75 minutes, K-17 and K-4 were sunk with all hands and K-6, K-7, K-14, and K-22 were all damaged. During a mock battle in the Bay of Biscay on January 20th, 1921, K-5 signaled that she was diving and then went silent, being lost with all hands. While the exact reason that K-5 sank is unknown, it's very likely that she went past her safe depth and was crushed. The last major incident is K-15, which sank in port due to the diving vents opening from the pressure of the hydraulic oil shifting with the temperature. K-15 had no loss of life when it went down, as the captain and crew acted very quickly when the ship began to sink. By 1926, all of the K-class submarines were decommissioned. The history of K-17 through K-21 actually continues past the history of the K-class alone, as they were converted into the M-class submarines, another strange design that'll cover another day. As you can see, it's with good reason that these subs were deemed the Calamity or Killer class. Overall, the K-class is just a strange design. Trying to make a submarine as part of a larger fleet isn't an inherently bad idea, but sacrificing the aspects that make submarines particularly useful most certainly is a bad idea. However, I would say that the K-Class came to be worse than the sum of its parts. It was a bad design, but most of the losses came down to terrible luck rather than design failures. But at the end of the day, the K-Class was unmistakably a flop. Thank you for watching.